Blog Talk Radio. Healthy and Tone Radio with your host, Darren Batman McDuck. And now, prepare to get fat. Hey, 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 welcome back to another episode of Perfectly Healthy and Tone Radio, brought to you by I'm the Fat Man.com. Great to be back. We didn't have a show last week. I actually had to reschedule with someone, so we didn't have a show last week. So hopefully we can reschedule um, that guest for another time. Um, The week before last, we had Noelle Cuero on the show, and she is a nutritionist, and Noelle is doing some really good things. So if you want to go back in the archives and listen to that show, that was a really, really good show. I really enjoyed speaking with her, and she, again, is doing some great things when it comes to Um, nutrition and helping people. She takes kind of the worst of the worst patients when they get to stage four cancer or something or things of that nature. And she actually ends up helping them and kind of nursing them back to health. And she believes that there's only one cause of disease. So that's a really good show to go back and listen to in archives. Tonight, we have the Metabolic Typing Diet by uh, William Bill Walcott. So I'm actually waiting for Bill will call in to the show to get um, to get everything ready. So um, while we're doing that, don't forget to connect with me on the various social media outlets. You can connect with me on Twitter at thefat underscore man dot com. You can also connect with me on Facebook. My Facebook fan page is the Fat Man Radio Show. That's P Fat is spelled with the P H A T Man Radio Show. So you can uh, connect with me there. Uh, you can also connect with me on t- uh, Pinterest. I believe I'm Darren McDuffie on Pinterest, so you can connect with me on on that uh, on Pinterest. And um, what other social media outlet is there? I can't remember what, I, what I, Twitter, Facebook, um, and Pinterest. Um, can't remember what else is out there, but I'm sure if it's something else that's out there that I'm missing, I'm sure that I'm on it. So <laughs> you'll have to find me. So again, I'm waiting for Bill to call in um, for the show. And he has not called in yet, so I'm not sure what's going on. So hold on for me one second. Bear with me, guys, for one second. Let me see. If you have a question for Bill and want to call into the show, the number is 646 716 9371. So 646 9371. And hold for me one second while I go and find out where Bill is. All right. Bill says he's in a queue, but I can't see him. Um, Bill, if you can hear me, can you call in via a phone, 646-716-9371? I'm not sure why I can't see you uh, in the queue here. Okay, there you go. Hey, Bill, are you there? I'm here, Darren. Oh, okay. I have no idea what happened. I couldn't see you in the queue. It was some weird thing with my browser. So I had to refresh my browser and you came up. So I'm glad to have you here on the show. I hope the audience, I didn't lose the audience there, but I'm glad (laughs) to have you have you on the show. It is one of those weird things, man, with computers. You you never know. No problem. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad to have you on the show tonight. Um, So let's get started. We had some dead air there and I didn't want to have that but let's go ahead and get started Bill um can you tell us a little bit about your background about how you uh, you have a really interesting background as I was reading in the book I read the book a couple of months ago but you have a, a really interesting background I know you work with uh uh Dr. Kelly at one point and I was very um amazed that you were one of the people that actually got to work with him but can you kind of share with us your background 
Yeah, sure. I've, I've been doing metabolic typing now for probably 37 years. So it, it's been a long time, actually. And I started out because I had some health issues of my own. Um, I was born with uh, really severe allergy problems. And all during my childhood, I saw all kinds of doctors and had all kinds of medical help that I could, but nothing ever touched it. And it wasn't until I was in my late 20s that um, I'm still suffering from the same problems that I ran into metabolic typing and Dr. Kelly's work. And when I started metabolic typing, it was the first time in my entire life that I became free of allergies. So <laughs> obviously, that really got my attention. And that uh-huh. really got me excited for, you know, what this thing called metabolic typing can be. So uh, one thing led to another, and I made contact with Dr. Kelly and, and took his training course and and right away became uh, his assistant and actually was the only assistant that, that he ever had. So I worked with him for a number of years until he left the field, and that was back in uh, 19... 19... Uh, 1980. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. ever since then, I've been researching and developing and and uh, working with metabolic typing. So it, it's really been an exciting time. I can honestly say I'm as excited today about metabolic typing than I was, you know, 35 years ago. It's an incredible, incredible science. Yeah, yeah. And Dr. Kelly, he was probably one of the first ones that ever wrote a book on um, uh, helping cancer, correct? Well, listen, there's been books about cancer, you know, from time immemorial, but he was uh, certainly the only one to write a book on cancer and, and metabolic typing. In fact, that's mm-hmm. how he, he really got into it. He, he discovered through working with the various people that what worked for one actually made a, another person's cancer worse. So that really got his attention and, and got him interested in research. Yeah, yeah, I uh, read up. I was reading a book um, regarding that about what works for one person with cancer may not work for the other person. So it's really, really interesting, and um, that's how I came about with metabolic typing. And I remember running out to the library and grabbing a book. And then after reading a book from the library, I said, "Well, you know what? I need to go to Amazon and buy this book." So I ended up <laughs> buying the book and um, and still uh, refer to it um, to this day. But um, let's get into the book and start um, talking a little bit about some of the terminology that's in there. One of the things that I found very interesting is um, you talk about the nervous system in there and the fact that a person can be either parasympathetic or sympathetic dominant. Can you kind of explain what that is and why that's important? Yeah, sure. And hopefully we won't get too technical and, and lose people's interest. But really when you when you get right down to it, the human body experiences hundreds of thousands of biochemical reactions every day. All the time these reactions are taking place, and they're what, what keep us alive. They're what what allows us to digest our food and for the heart to pump our blood and for the brain to function. And everything that you can think of that takes place in the body goes through biochemical reactions. And yet, even though there are these hundreds of thousands of reactions that take place, they all fall under the control of just a handful of control systems. We call these fundamental homeostatic controls. So a a quick way to kind of get get the idea is just think of corporations. You might have a a multinational corporation with, you know, 5,000 offices and 500,000 employees, and they may be in, you know, 50 different countries in the world. And yet this incredible conglomerate is only run by a handful of people. So the same is true in the human body. The body's function is regulated through these fundamental control systems. And one of the primary fundamental control systems is the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system regulates everything that is involuntary. The voluntary things are, are like you saying, okay, I'm, I'm thirsty, so I'm going to get up and go get a drink of water. That's a voluntary action. But most everything else, that takes place that keeps us alive, that happens through the involuntary nervous system or the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system is broken into two different branches, sympathetic and parasympathetic. 
And as it turns out, mm -hmm. the nervous system is also connected to the endocrine system, the endocrine glands, like your thyroid gland and your adrenal gland and so forth. And we all inherit different strengths and weaknesses throughout the endocrine system and actually throughout the body entirely, the body as a whole. And if we just think for a moment, people that we know, we're very different in how the body is, not only in terms of its external appearance, right? I mean, some people are tall, some people are short, some people are heavy, some people are thin, and on and on. Some people have dark skin, some people have light skin, some people have curly hair, some people have straight hair, and the list just goes on and on and on. Well, these differences also extend internally. We have different sizes and shapes and placements of our different organs and glands. Did you know that, for example, in many people, the heart is on the left side of the chest, but in others, it's in the center, and in others, on the right side. Some people's stomachs are shaped in a certain way. Other people's stomachs are shaped in a totally different way. Some have large stomachs, some have small stomachs. Some have a large spleen, other has a small spleen, and, and again, this goes on and on and on. So these differences that make us who we are, these unique differences that we inherit, extend throughout the body, through the systems, through the organs, through the glands, through the tissues, and through the cells. And the autonomic nervous system is one of these fundamental control systems that regulate everything. So we, as individuals, we inherit different strengths and weaknesses within the nervous system. All right, so big deal. So what? Everybody, you know, thinks that we're different, and that's that's true. We are. But but what's the point? The point is, and this is really fascinating. The point is that this autonomic nervous system regulates everything that takes place in our body and fibers from the autonomic nervous system, from the sympathetic and the parasympathetic branches, go to every one of our cells in the body. And the body has mm -hmm. 100 trillion cells. I mean, just imagine that we are wired in this way. And yet, it makes a lot of sense, right? The nervous system regulates everything that takes place. So, of course, it has to have contact with every cell in the body. But here's the kicker, Darren. Guess what? Food has specific stimulatory or inhibitory effects on the nervous system. Certain foods stimulate the sympathetic side and other foods stimulate the parasympathetic side. So here is a great secret about nutrition. You know, everybody can pay lip service to nutrition, right? I mean, everybody mm -hmm. says, yeah, nutrition is important. You've got to eat a good diet if you want to be healthy. But, you know, how? How does that work? Why is that the case? How does diet impact our function? And, and what is a good diet for a person? Well, if we are all unique individuals, then we can't all do well on the same diet. And again, that's, that's common sense. That's, that's everyday observation. We know people who are doing great on a certain diet, but we also know other people, and maybe we're included in that, who do terrible on that diet. One diet will make one person skinny, but that same diet will make somebody else fat. And why is that? It's because of this scenario that I'm describing about the body and how it functions. The fundamental control system that regulates every activity in the body, the autonomic nervous system, is specifically stimulated or inhibited by certain foods. Wow, just just think what that means. So it means that food is much more than just calories. It's not just calories in the sense of fuel. It has regulatory influence on the body. So since we all inherit these different strengths and weaknesses in the nervous system, it's very important that we find out what foods are right for, for us. We don't mm -hmm. want to eat foods that are stimulating imbalances that we have naturally inherited. We want to eat foods that help balance our body chemistry, that maximize our metabolic efficiency, that optimize our function, that, that literally free up or unfold our full genetic potential for, for what life has to offer us through this physical body. So that's, that's what metabolic typing is. Metabolic typing is 
the only way that I know of to assess what food is right and what food is wrong for you in terms of this this uh, autonomic nervous system in the body that, that regulates every activity in the body. And it also analyzes and assesses what is called the oxidation rate. This is the activity that takes place inside the cells, inside every one of those hundred trillion cells. And again, we're talking these numbers, we're throwing out these numbers here that are just, uh-huh. it's kind of uh-huh. mind-blowing, you know, when you think about it. Like if you took a stopwatch and you started right now in this interview and we hit our stopwatch and we said, okay, we'll click the stopwatch off after a hundred trillion seconds clicks, clicks by. You know what time it would be? It would be 1.5 million years into the future. That's wow. how big a number wow. 100 trillion is, and yet that's what our body is composed of, 100 trillion cells. And the nervous system connects to every one of those cells, and food stimulates the nervous system. And food also stimulates or inhibits the oxidation that takes place inside the cells. And what's that? Oxidation is what happens to your food when you, when you eat it. When we eat food, we digest it, hopefully, and if we digest it, then we absorb it into the bloodstream, and the bloodstream takes nutrients to all of those 100 trillion cells in the body. And it's there that the, those nutrients are taken into the cells and are utilized by the cells as fuel. And that fuel is utilized, it's burnt up, it's oxidized, and it's, it's, it's used to create energy for the cells to function. So just like we go to the gas station and put fuel into our car so that the engine can burn the fuel for energy and run the car, that's also why we eat food. Food is where the body acquires the energy it needs in order to exist, in order to live, in order for those cells to function. So if it's a brain cell, the brain cell takes in the nutrients, converts it to energy, and that's how the brain functions. If it's a heart cell, same thing. If it's a stomach Mm -hmm. cell, in order to create and secrete hydrochloric acid so you can digest protein, it's dependent upon the fuel, the energy that the cell has in the stomach in order to fulfill its function. So every tissue in the body, bones, muscles, skin, brains, heart, liver, kidney, every cell in the body, every tissue in the body, every organ, every gland, every system, it's dependent upon in the final analysis, the ability to convert food or fuel into energy. So if we eat the wrong kind of food, what happens to this process? Not only do we create an imbalance to the autonomic nervous system, but we also are not able to fully convert our food to energy. And if we can't do that properly, a whole lot of bad happens, man. Then we start yeah. storing calories as fat. Then the cells can't convert fuel to energy, so cellular function suffers. But cellular function means that the organs and glands that the cells comprise, that they start not functioning the way they're designed to function. Now the brain isn't functioning right. Now we're getting anxious. Now we're getting nervous. Now we're getting depressed. Now we can't think straight. Now we're getting spacey. But, you know, we're, we're having this interview if I got spacey, I'd lose my train of thought and say, well, what was I just saying? <laughs> or the, the, yeah. brain, the brain can't focus, it can't concentrate, or it gets ADD or ADHD. Why do these things happen? This is not normal. The body's not born with those things. I'll tell you why it happens. It happens for only one of two reasons, or both reasons. The first is either the body's not getting the right fuel the right food that it needs in order for the nervous system, which regulates everything that happens in the body to function normally, or it's not getting the right fuel to produce the energy in the cells that the cells need in order for the glands and tissues and nervous system and everything else to function the way it functions. So that's number one. That's reason number one. Either the body's not getting the right fuel for its metabolic type, or the body is accumulating substances that it shouldn't have that are disrupting and blocking the way the body is supposed to function. We call these stressors and blocking factors. These are all the environmental toxins that we all encounter every day. 
pesticides and herbicides and air pollution and pollution in our water and pollution in our food, uh, all of the heavy metal toxins like aluminum and cadmium and mercury and arsenic and all of these substances. The body is accumulating these substances and they are toxic to the body and they are disrupting normal function. So when these two things start to happen, then what starts to happen is this beautiful, incredible entity that we call the human body that is designed to be perfect. It's designed to function perfectly. Then it starts not functioning the way it was designed to function. And that's another really important thing, another really important point, that every single cell in your body, dear, has genetic information. It's got a blueprint of exactly what it's supposed to do and how to do it perfectly. So a brain cell knows how to function. A heart cell knows how to function, knows how to be a heart. A liver cell knows how to function. A kidney cell knows how to function. An immune cell knows how to function. So all this is designed in. It's like a blueprint for perfection. And that's what the human body is. That's what it's designed to be is perfect. And it will be if we give it the opportunity. But what do we do? Well, we give it the wrong food and the wrong fuel so that the nervous system can't function and the cells can't function and the cells can't produce the energy they need to function. And at the same time, we are stockpiling the body with all of these chemicals, 100,000 chemicals that the body has never seen before prior to 100 years ago. These are accumulating in the body. And the result of that is malfunction, poor health, low energy, depression, anxiety, ulcers, uh, digestive disturbances, uh, heart, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, arthritis, obesity, you name it. Every single one of these diseases, mm-hmm. which are known as mm-hmm. chronic degenerative diseases, those, those are responsible for over 97% of complaints that we have as human beings. So all of those diseases, 97% of the things that afflict us, we don't have to experience those things. You shouldn't ever have to experience a degenerative disease. Yes, you give your body what it's designed to have, and yes, you get rid of the substances that shouldn't be there. And that's what metabolic typing is. Yeah. That's what's involved. Yeah, let's um, yeah. talk about the... the uh, the fact of fast oxidizers and slow oxidizers. What does that mean? If a person is a fast oxidizer or a slow oxidizer? Right. So just like in the autonomic nervous system, a person could be more sympathetic dominant or more parasympathetic dominant. In the oxidative system, that, that activity that takes place inside the cells, a person could have an oxidation rate that is too fast or an oxidation rate that is too slow. So we term these types of people fast oxidizers and slow oxidizers. And that refers to the rate of carbohydrate metabolism. Carbohydrates are fruits, vegetables, and grains. That's where carbohydrates primarily come from. So fast oxidizers are burning carbohydrates too quickly. Slow oxidizers burn carbohydrates too slowly. And in either case, what happens is a deficient energy production out of the total energy that could be produced in the cells from from the food that you eat. So an example of a fast oxidizer is like an Eskimo, an Eskimo in the Arctic, whose ancestral diet, whose indigenous diet is literally 100% protein and fat and either very little carbohydrate or no carbohydrate at all. And they have evolved to thrive on that kind of diet. They do so well on that that diet that they don't even have a word for cancer or heart disease in their language. I mean, it's it's mind blowing. So that's a fast oxidizer. Why why do they have a fa- why do they have a fast oxidizer metabolism? So that they are perfectly suited for foods that slow down the oxidation rate and bring it into balance. So proteins and fats will do just that. That's Those foods slow down the oxidation rate. Carbohydrates, fruits, vegetables, and grains, speed up the oxidation rate. So the Eskimo is perfectly adapted to his environment. You know, sub-zero temperatures, no 
avocado trees or lemon trees growing outside the igloo, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh, no fruits uh -huh. and vegetables. The only food that they have naturally available are animal proteins for the most part. So their diet that they've evolved to be perfectly adapted to are high-protein, high-fat, low-carbohydrate diet. So that's the perfect diet for fast oxidizers. But slow oxidizers, those who have metabolisms that really evolved in the, the tropical climates or those areas where carbohydrates were the primary foods, like the Tucacenta people in, in Papua New Guinea, their diet, their ancestral diet, their indigenous diet, is over 90% carbohydrates, the exact opposite of the Eskimo. So those types of metabolizers are slow oxidizers. So they don't do well as a result of that, eating foods that slow down the oxidation rate even more, which are the proteins and the fats. They do really well eating a high carbohydrate diet to increase the oxidation rate. So what's interesting about this is that you can think of those two groups of people, the Eskimos and the Tucacentas, that's kind of like metabolic typing shorthand. You know, we can see how these two groups of people evolve to become perfectly adapted to their environment. And when I say evolve, I'm talking about the forces of adaptation, genetic mutation, uh, natural selection, and survival of the fittest, which you just distill all that down, and that basically means if you didn't thrive as an Eskimo on all protein and fat, you were the weak one. You know, you were the sickly one. You didn't get away from the polar bear. You didn't win the knife fight. You were weeded out of the gene pool. So that what's left in the Arctic are those genes that are perfectly suited to the environment. And the same is true for the, the Tucacenta and the high-carbohydrate diet. But what's interesting about this is that each one of us have exactly the same type of genetically inherited requirements for nutrition. And that's, that's a big thing. What that means is that, you know, talking about, well, what, what's the right diet? What's the right diet for me? What that means is it's not what your friend says it should be. It's not what a magazine article says, or it's not what even some nutrition expert comes on and says you should eat. It's not what you see in a late night infomercial or, or it, it's not the latest and greatest, you know, diet to come down the pike. Like the most recent one is the paleo diet. It's none of those things. Mm -hmm. The only diet mm -hmm. that is right for each person is the one that is right for their metabolic type, meaning their genetically based requirements. So just like our genes dictate the color of our skin and, and our eyes and how strong our heart is and our stomach and you know, the placement of the organs, the glands, and all those different things, genes also dictate what foods are right for you. And if you don't believe that, then just look what happens when, a, when an Eskimo has high carbohydrate. Look what happens when an Eskimo drinks alcohol. They get whacked out from that. Mm -hmm. And that's because mm -hmm. their metabolisms are not designed to utilize high carbohydrate. And what are the... Alcohol is pure sugar. Yeah, what are the different types? Let's just get into the different types. I know um, from reading your book and, and doing the questionnaire, I'm a protein type. There's no doubt. But what are the um, the other? There are two other types. What are the what are the uh, metabolic types? Well, yeah, I mean, there's different ways that we talk about this. The different broad categories are protein types, carb types, and mixed. Uh -huh. But those really aren't metabolic types. Metabolic, they're, they're literally, and I'm not trying to sidestep your question. I'm going to be literal here. There literally are as many metabolic types as there are individuals. There are so many different factors that go into defining what a metabolic type is. But there also are these broader categories. And, and the two foundational fundamental homeostatic control systems that define these two basic broad categories are the autonomic types, the autonomic nervous system, and the oxidation rate. And within the autonomic nervous system, we find sympathetic types, mixed, I'm sorry, balanced types, and parasympathetic types. The sympathetic type is a, a kind of carb type, and it, it stems from the dominance of the autonomic nervous system in that person's metabolism to dictate what foods are right for them. So a sympathetic dominant carb type would do very well on a high carbohydrate diet with certain types of carbohydrates and a lower protein 
lower fat diet. A parasympathetic, on the other hand, would do well with just the reverse, a high protein and fat diet and a low carbohydrate diet. And then within the oxidative component, we have fast oxidizers, mixed oxidizers, and slow oxidizers. And which one is responsible for a person's metabolic type in a given individual depends upon their dominance. And that's what metabolic typing does. It sorts all that out. It determines your metabolic type. And once we know your metabolic type, then we know a great deal. Then we know exactly what foods are right for you and what foods are wrong for you. It's not just a matter of knowing that you need, say, um, you know, a certain amount of protein and fat and a certain amount of carbohydrate. It's, it's what proteins and what fats and what carbohydrates are good for you. Which fruits, which vegetables, which grains, which animal proteins are good for you. Interestingly, if you take, say, the dark meat of a piece of chicken and a light meat piece of chicken, it doesn't do the same thing in everyone's metabolism. Depending upon your metabolic type, you'll either thrive on light meat or you'll thrive on dark meat. Depending upon your metabolic type, you'll thrive on red meat or you won't. It'll be bad for you. So everything that you read, everything that you hear about a food that says, oh, well, this food is good for you. Oh, no, this food is bad for you. None of that is true for all people. And I'm talking here, of course, about whole natural foods. There are many synthetic foods and processed foods that are bad for you and bad for everybody. I'm talking about whole natural foods. So this whole idea that, oh, don't eat red meat, it causes cancer. Oh, really? Is that true? Mm-hmm. Well, why why don't all Eskimos have cancer? This this whole idea that, oh, well, don't eat dairy. Dairy is bad for you. Oh, really? Well, what about the indigenous Swiss, who dairy is a staple for? Dairy comprises a huge portion of their diet. Not only that, but so does rye. So here's another food. The paleo people say, oh, don't eat grains. Grains are bad for you. Oh, really? Well, then how do you explain the indigenous Swiss? They thrive on dairy and grains. And it just so happens that this is true about every food that you can name. There is no food that is good for everybody, and there's no food that is bad for everybody. If a food is good for you or bad for you, that's only relative to you, to your metabolic type, to your right. genetically based requirements. Bill, um, so why is it that... For instance, you have a lot of people who there's always this debate against uh, meat eaters versus vegans. And what I've noticed lately that a lot of vegans are starting back eating meat. Why is it that someone can do um, be a vegan for a while and they're doing really, really well, and then all of a sudden they, their health just goes downhill? Oh, that's a great question. <clears throat> But it gets a little bit complicated. I'm going to try and make it really simple. Yeah, make it easy for us. <laughs> let's, let's draw a line in the air. You know, hold up your index finger and draw a line in the air from left to right. And, and that's going to represent, let's say, the oxidative dominant people. So on the, on the left-hand side of that line, let's put slow oxidizers. And make it a big line, big, long line. So on the left-hand side, that's the slow oxidizer area. In the center is a mixed oxidizer area, and on the right-hand side, all the way over to the end, that's a fast oxidizer area. So on this spectrum of metabolic types in the oxidative dominant category, if you move out of the mixed oxidative area, you go to the right and you start heading into fast oxidation, notice that as you just cross over from mixed oxidation into fast oxidation, that's just what we would call kind of slight fast oxidation. And as you go further to the right, it becomes stronger. You become stronger and stronger of a fast oxidizer until you get to the far end of that line where the Eskimo is. So an extreme fast oxidizer, they must eat all protein and fat, no carbohydrate or very, very little. But not all fast oxidizers are the same. Remember what I said about as many metabolic types as there are individuals. So there are slight fast oxidizers, medium fast oxidizers, strong fast oxidizers, extreme fast oxidizers. That means that 
someone who's a slight fast oxidizer, they would need a lot more carbohydrate than an extreme fast oxidizer, right? Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you are, genetically speaking, if you are a slight fast oxidizer or even, say, a medium fast oxidizer, and you start eating like a vegetarian, then the effect of that is not really going to show itself right away. But the effect of diet and nutrition is cumulative. And if you're listening out there, hear that again. The effect of nutrition is cumulative. Why? Because foods and nutrients have that specific stimulatory or inhibitory effect on those fundamental control systems. So the longer someone who is a slight fast oxidizer eats a vegetarian diet, the more they are pushing their system further and further to the right on that line, the more they are pushing themselves out of balance. So that means that you can feel okay initially, and you might even go through some purification, some detoxification by eating a vegan diet for a little while. But there's a difference between a therapeutic diet and a regular daily diet. That regular daily diet, if you eat the foods that are wrong for you, you will pay the piper. It will have an adverse effect. It's just a question of sooner or later. If you're an Eskimo and you start eating that way, boom, you feel the effects right away. Why? Because you're on that right end of that line. You're in that extreme imbalance category. So eating the wrong food has a powerful effect immediately. But if you're real close to that kind of balanced area, even though it's wrong for you, you're not going to have that powerful effect. Your body still can adapt to it. It can still compensate for the food, even though it's wrong. But the effect of the diet is cumulative. The longer you eat it, the more it's pushing you, the more it's shifting your metabolism off into that deeper and deeper imbalance of fast oxidation. And now yeah. You're, yeah. you start noticing you've lost your health. Your energy is not so good. You're, you're hungry all the time. You're craving sweets. Um, you're getting sick when you didn't used to get sick. And when you get sick, it's taking longer to get well than you used to get well. Maybe you're developing some arthritis and you're saying, wow, where's this stuff coming from? I felt great on a vegetarian diet. A vegetarian diet was good for me. It made me feel good. Well, that's the problem. It's not about that. It's about your genetically based requirements. If you don't give your body what it needs, it's going to do everything it can to compensate and to defend against the mistakes that you're making. But eventually, you're going to pay the piper. Eventually, the wrongdoing that you have been doing is going to start coming to the surface because your body can no longer do what it's been doing to to undo the mistake that you've made. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Actually, I wanted to kind of jump off of that into something that kind of pertains to the same thing. And it's always uh, people speak about disease and how disease Diseases can't develop in a body that's alkaline, or you know, if a body, if your body is acidic, what's your what's your take on the whole acid acid alkaline uh, balance? <laughs> well, that question and that whole subject drives me crazy, dude. Because, <laughs> I know because there's so much ignorance about this, so much misinformation, and yet it's the most basic textbook aspect of biochemistry and physiology. So people who make these statements, I don't know what to say. Either they're total idiots, which I don't think is the case, or they just forgot what they learned, or maybe they're just out you know, to sell a product. I really don't know. I don't understand it. But here is the truth. Here is the truth of biochemistry and physiology. It's not an opinion. It's not what I'm saying. It's known fact. And, and by the way, this was proved by a brilliant researcher by the name of Emmanuel Ravisi. For over 60 years, he did laboratory research on this very topic. And he showed that the healthy human body 
is supposed to cycle acid and alkaline twice over a 24-hour period. And if you don't do that, if you, if you stay alkaline or if you stay acid, you are either sick already or your body is in absolute all-out defense trying to change what is going on, trying to undo a degenerative process. So that's point number one. Point number two is that, remember that autonomic nervous system discussion we had about sympathetic and parasympathetic and how mm-hmm. the sympathetic and mm-hmm. parasympathetic divisions of the nervous system regulate all biochemical processes in the body? Everything that takes place? Well, it just so happens that everything that the sympathetic system does and it does it through enzymes, which everything takes place through enzymes in the body. The only enzymes that function through a sympathetic innervation are enzymes that function in an acid medium. And the only enzymes that the that can be utilized or activated through the parasympathetic system are those that function in an alkaline medium. So again, if you stay alkaline or you stay acid, you are undermining your body's normal function. You will not function normal. Your body will not be able to adapt to stress. It will not be able to resolve stresses. It will not be able to defend itself against cancer, against diabetes, against arthritis, against any degenerative disease you can name. So that's the facts. Anybody who tells you you should be alkaline, well, I've already said, I don't, I don't know where that person's coming from. Something's very wrong in their thinking, period. So this whole, like, alkaline water... They're probably water. too alkaline. They're probably too alkaline, and they can't think straight, because when you do <laughs> get too alkaline, by the way, you get spacey. You can't remember things. Right. You can't so the, think properly. So the whole alkaline water, is that... I mean, people are always telling, like, you should drink alkaline water and all this stuff, so that really has no merit, no alkaline water or anything like that. No, not really. I mean, if if you have a, if you are a para, if you are a parasympathetic dominant, you've already got an alkaline imbalance. If you're a slow oxidizer dominant, you've already got an alkaline imbalance. If you've got an imbalance, you don't want to do something to further the imbalance. Remember what I said: there is no food or nutrient that is right for everybody at therapeutic levels, and the same goes for water. Yeah, alkaline is good for some. It's not good for other people. Acid is good for some, not good for other people. You have to find out what is right for you if you want to be healthy. Yeah. Hey, I see some people with switchboard. If you have a question, just hit one on your switchboard, and I'll bring you on to ask Bill the question. 646-716-9371. If you're out there listening, 646-716-9371. Bill, with the I know everybody's out there probably wanting to know this question that I'm going to ask next because most of us have or are, are suffering from the need to get rid of excess weight. How with metabolic typing, how can we reset our, our fat thermostat? Well, it's actually everything we've been talking about. It's giving your body what it's designed to utilize as fuel. Now let me try to explain that in a, using an analogy that I I really like. You know, we talked before about engines. So let's take that a little bit further. There are different kinds of engines, right? We have gasoline engines and you have diesel engines. Uh-huh. And, and what do we know about that? We know that gasoline engines require gasoline for fuel. You can't put diesel into a gasoline engine. And the same is true about a diesel engine. A diesel engine requires diesel fuel. You can't put gasoline into a diesel engine and expect it to function the way it's designed to function. And the same is true in the human body. If you don't get the right foods, if you don't get the right macronutrient ratios, the proper proportions of proteins and fats and carbohydrates that your body is genetically programmed to utilize for fuel, then your engines of metabolism, meaning your cells, those 100 trillion cells, those cells won't be able to convert that those nutrients into energy. It won't be able to burn it up as fuel. And what happens then? Then your body ends up storing the calories as fat instead of burning them up for fuel. So if you want to normalize your weight, you need to eat right for your metabolic type. 
you need to give your body what it is designed to utilize for fuel. It's, it's very, very simple. And it, it works both ways. If you are underweight, if you can't gain weight, if you've been trying to gain weight and you're, you're chronically underweight, it's the same problem. Give your body what it's designed to utilize for fuel, and your body will seek its normal, natural, healthy weight. Yeah. What, and this is another question for you. Um, craving foods. What, what, if you're craving something all the time or you have food cravings, what is your body trying to tell you? Man, Darren, that's a great question. Man, I don't know where you came up with these, but they're right <laughs> on point. Cravings are a great sign to you that you are not eating right for your metabolic type. What happens is, you know, and we've all had this experience, and some people unfortunately have it on a daily basis. But here it is, you know, we go to a meal, let's say it's lunchtime, we go eat lunch, and we eat a big meal and we're just really stuffed. We ate what what was really good tasting food and we're really stuffed, and I'll be darned, but, you know, 30 minutes later, we're hungry again, or we're craving sweet, or we're craving some specific kind of food. What has happened, What what is taking place is, those, the food that you ate has been ingested, then it's been digested, then it's been transported through the bloodstream, it's been taken to those 100 trillion cells, it's been taken into the cells, and the cells can't convert the nutrients to energy. So now you've got 100 trillion cells screaming to the brain, give us some energy, and that's what a craving is. That's what's happening on a physiological and biochemical level, and it gets it gets transferred through the nervous system and, and processed through the brain as a craving. It's actually a cellular craving for energy. So when you are craving sweet, it means that you didn't give your cells the right kind of fuel. Now, you've all had this experience also. When you eat the right kind of meal, how does that make you feel? It makes you feel great, right? You're not yeah. soon after. You're not craving sweets. Your mind's functioning great. You can focus. You can concentrate. You're not anxious. You're not depressed. You're, you're not nervous. Um, you are totally satisfied, and, and you're not thinking about food like, oh, man, I've got to go get a snack, or I've got to go get a candy bar, or I've got to go eat something. You're totally satisfied. Physically, you're strong. You've got plenty of energy to last you to the next meal. That's how you tell if you are eating right for your metabolic type. If you're not going down that list, and if you're not clicking every one of those off, in other words, if you're not totally satisfied, if you are getting cravings, if you're craving sweets, if you're not physically strong and energized after eating, if your emotions are not what they should be, and if your mind isn't functioning perfectly the entire day from one meal to the next, right up through your evening meal and right up to bedtime, then you are not eating right for your metabolic type. Why? Because that's how the body is designed. It's designed to be perfect. You are designed to be energetic. You are designed to have a clear mind, to focus, to concentrate. You're not designed to have ADD and ADHD and depression and anxiety. Those things aren't normal. You're not designed to have digestive problems and stomach cramps and gas and bloating and, and constipation and diarrhea. You're not designed to have you know, autism and and ALS and cancer and diabetes and heart disease, all these things that we think are, oh, that's just part of living. Oh, yeah, that's just part of aging. Bull. That's not the way it is. Your body is designed to be perfect. And don't forget that. If you are not feeling those things after every meal that you are eating, then I hope a light goes off in your head. You ought to start hearing the piper you know, blowing his flute because, son, you're going to be paying the piper one day soon. It's just a matter of sooner or later. If you don't give your body what it needs, if you are not eating foods that are stimulating and inhibiting the nervous system the way it should, if you are not eating a diet that is optimizing energy production in your cells so that your cells and organs and glands and systems can function the way they are designed to function, then you are going to have a health problem. It's going to start little at first. First, it's going to be, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of low on energy today. Maybe I need to eat something. Then there's going to be some aches and pains or some headaches or some allergy or some food sensitivity or some gas or some bloating, some little things. And as time goes on, years go go on, they get a little bit worse. You start accumulating more, and then suddenly you go, man, 
I just don't feel right. So you go to a doctor. Now you've got a full-blown diagnosable degenerative disease. Why? Because you didn't give your body what it needed. You didn't eat right for your metabolic time. And that's how it works. Yeah. So this now, thing that we're going through right now, we shouldn't be going through that in our society. It is 100% unnecessary. All right. The last right. question I have for you, everybody's in the, the switchboard and nobody wants to answer any, ask any questions. So this is my last question for you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and this is a doozy because I remember from reading in the book, um, you talk about supplements and everybody's trying to supplement. But supplements, uh, from your book, I learned that supplements can kind of hurt the body if they're a certain type of their parasympathetic or sympathetic dominant. Can you kind of talk about that? Absolutely. Well, everything that I've been saying about foods, about how they stimulate the sympathetic and the parasympathetic elements of the nervous system and how they increase or slow down the oxidation rate, everything that I've said about food applies exactly to supplements. Certain nutrients specifically stimulate the sympathetic system. Calcium stimulates the sympathetic system. Phosphorus stimulates the sympathetic system. Other nutrients specifically stimulate the parasympathetic system. Potassium stimulates the parasympathetic. Uh, Magnesium results in parasympathetic stimulation. And the same is true about slow oxidation and fast oxidation. So, if you are a parasympathetic dominant and you start eating like a vegetarian and you start taking potassium and taking chlorella, which is high in potassium, you are simply going to stimulate the parasympathetic system even further and you're going to create even further imbalances that you already have. Maybe you're suffering from osteoarthritis, which can result from a perpetually alkaline system where the body is too alkaline. And maybe you are parasympathetic dominant and that's why you are too alkaline. So now you're going to eat a vegetarian diet, with, which is very high in potassium, and you're going to start taking chlorella because it's a miracle superfood. That's only going to stimulate your parasympathetic system further, which is only going to make you even more alkaline, which is only going to worsen your osteoarthritis. So this is true about every nutrient. So if you're taking supplements, you better know what your metabolic type is. You better know if that supplement is right for your metabolic type or if it's wrong. If it's going to worsen your metabolic type imbalance that you already have. So all this stuff that you read, oh, you should take this nutrient for that problem. Oh, really? Huh. Well, if that's the case, then you're going to have to tell me why. Let's use an example. Let's take niacin. Niacin is good for cholesterol, right? It'll lower cholesterol. Oh, is that right? Well, then why does niacin raise cholesterol in some people? Or let's talk about, again, cholesterol and heart disease. So everybody knows that if you have heart disease, if you have high cholesterol, you shouldn't eat saturated fats and you shouldn't eat red meat. Oh, is that right? Well, how come all Eskimos don't suffer from heart disease? Remember, they don't even have a language for heart disease or a word for heart disease in their language. Why does a high-protein, high-fat diet actually lower cholesterol of all types? And why does a high-carbohydrate diet, a diet high in fruits and vegetables and high in low-fat proteins and and low-purine proteins, why does that kind of diet elevate cholesterol in some people? Well, here's the truth. All diseases, whether it's heart disease, or arthritis, or diabetes, or just high cholesterol, all health complaints, all diseases, they are not the problems that need to be treated. They are symptoms of the imbalances within the metabolic type. So when people come to us and have, you know, this disease or that disease, it doesn't even matter. We simply address their metabolic type. So you can have one metabolic type that has heart disease that is a sympathetic dominant, a carb type that needs high carbohydrate, low protein, low fat, and another person with the exact same disease, but who's a protein type, and they need high protein, high fat, low carbohydrate. So if we don't even think about their disease, but we we treat their metabolic type, we give their bodies what their bodies were designed to utilize for fuel, guess what happens? Cholesterol lowers in both types. Heart disease goes away in both types. 
Why? Not because we treated the disease. The disease is the symptom of the deeper underlying imbalances. Instead, we understood their genetically based requirements for nutrition. We understood what each person's body needed in order to function optimally. And that's what we gave them. And that's why the body reversed the degenerative condition. Remember, I said that degenerative disease is 100% unnecessary. It only occurs because we gave the body the wrong foods and it couldn't utilize the foods we gave it in order to function the way it's designed to function and or the body had accumulated too many substances from the environment, too many toxins. So you change that equation and now there's no longer a basis for regeneration. Instead, regeneration occurs. Instead, the body starts building health naturally. Why? Because that's what it's designed to do. It's always trying to do that. Every cell in your body, brain cell, heart cell, liver cell, kidney cell, skin cell, bone cell, every cell in your body, the immune cells, they are programmed to function in a very specific way, in a perfect way. And when they don't, it's only because they didn't get what they need in order to function properly. So if you want good health, find out what your metabolic type is. Start giving your body what it's designed to utilize for nutrients and get rid of the substances in your lifestyle that are blocking factors and stressors that are disrupting the body's normal style of functioning. And health will be yours. Yep. Yeah, yep. your book is uh, Metabolic Typing Diet. And what's your website, Bill? MetabolicTyping.com. So go to the website. The book is worth the purchase price. Like I said, I read it at the library, and then I went to Amazon and bought it off of Amazon, and it's helped me a lot because I used to be one of those people that were afraid of eating too much meat, and now I know my protein. I, I know I'm a protein type, and that's what I feel satisfied with, eating meat, and I don't worry about it anymore. So if you're out there and you are puzzled by what your diet is or what you should be eating, this book has a questionnaire in it. You take the questionnaire and it'll tell you exactly what your type is, and you just eat according to your type, and it'll it'll help you. But, Bill Walcott, thank you for being on Perfectly Healthy and Tone Radio. And I know this show could have easily been three hours. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'd love to, to have you. Yeah, I, I mean, no, not not that. But I'd love to have you come on and talk a little bit more about your experience with – come back again and talk a little bit more about your experience with Dr. Kelly because – um, my mom passed away of cancer in 2005, and I found it really intriguing that you worked with him and you knew some of his research and what he uh, thought about cancer. And like I said, when the show started, I read one of his books and uh, found out a lot about the whole thing of somebody might be able to eat meat. Uh, on cancer, and it's usually that we pull meat out of the diet and, and put people on vegetarian diets and juicing and all this other stuff when they have cancer, not knowing that they could be a totally different type and that they might thrive on meat or get better eating meat. And we tend to think, well, meat is one of the things that we need to pull out of the diet because a person can be acidic. So this kind of threw that all to the wayside for me to metabolic typing book. So I do thank you for coming on tonight. All right, Darren. Thanks very much for having me. That was fun. Yep, it was. All right. Thank you, Bill, and um, have a good evening.